Hi, my name is Jerry Croft, and I am a um, Associate Professor Emeritus in uh, the Graduate Division of Counseling Psychology at Santa Clara University, and um, this is a talk on the JFK assassination and the psychological aspects of it, as well as the entire detective story. I wrote a book called Conspiracy in Camelot, The Complete History of the Assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. So this book really is a, th a, a thoroughgoing review of everything, plus a psychological interpretation of this. So I, I would like to introduce you to the method a little bit. Um, the psychology of Kennedy is very, very important, uh, and we often disregard it. The Kennedy mystique is uh, something that Americans are dimly aware of. I mean, th the term is out, obviously out there, but Americans in the 1960s did not realize that they fell in love. Okay, uh, Now, when the American people are asked uh, to rate the, the best presidents, uh, Kennedy comes in third, right after George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But when historians are asked to rate the Kennedy presidency, it comes in like 30th. What did he do? Uh, he tried to do some things in civil rights and failed. Um, he almost got us blown up at the Cuban Missile Crisis. He started the Peace Corps. So historians do not at all fall into the Kennedy mystique the way the American people did. Now, there are 600 books written about John F. Kennedy, more than any other president in American history. Uh, so this is what Carl Jung calls, in a sense, numinosity. He is bigger than life. Uh, numinosity also means that you're frozen in your tracks, that uh, an event occurs like this, and almost every conscious American remembered where they were, who they were with, how they heard the news of Kennedy's death. Uh, these are, to Jung, when, a, when a, a dream, for example, is numinous. That is, it's an unforgettable, vivid dream. That it, you just can't get it out of your head. He said those kind of dreams are archetypal. They involve a participation of the collective unconscious. And this whole Kennedy operation uh, has numinosity all over it. Uh, for example, I did a, <clears throat> a, a cute review. I wanted to count the number of articles written about John F. Kennedy five years after his death, and the number of articles written about Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, five years after his death. Kennedy outscores the biggest rock and roll star uh, in American history. And um, so Kennedy is a, 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 a star, effectively. Now, in writing a book, I, uh, I go and I say, well, I would like to know about the cover-up. A cover-up, where do I find about, uh, that, that information? And there is no place that you can find out about the cover-up. You hear about it. You hear about this person or that person. So in like 10 years of research on this, every time I came across an example of a person who is covering up information. I put it in a table. Well, <clears throat> there are like uh, 60 uh, inserts here. The cover-up is a major story. I heard about Kennedy's mistresses, but I, I could never find a book written solely on that topic or even a chapter written solely. Just anecdotal stories here and there. And I said, I just wonder how, how many were there? And every time I came upon another story, I put it in my table, and then I checked it out and tried to corroborate it. I, I was interested in theories about the Kennedy assassination, but you'd read a book on the mafia theory, but it wouldn't uh, deal with the CIA theory, and vice versa. There was no book that really had an in-depth look at all the theories about the Kennedy assassination. Similarly, with the prosecution and the defense, you'd read a book that was prosecutorial, you would read a book that was conspiratorial, but I wanted to see it all in one spot. So that's what my book was. It was an attempt to compensate for the lack of these things. So, for example, in uh, just as a, a, an example, of the, I have a short section on all of Kennedy's mistresses. And it's astonishing. Absolutely out of this world. Uh, Judith Campbell Exeter, Judith Exeter Campbell, Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, Pamela Turner, 
She was Jackie Kennedy's press secretary. Mimi Beardsley was an intern, 19 years old, lost her virginity to John F. Kennedy in the, uh, out of in the White House, but during the White House years. And uh, so uh, one of the conclusions of this exercise, there are 32, but there were actually 33 mistresses in 33 months in the White House. So his friend, George Smathers, a senator, said, there's no question about the fact that Jack had the most active libido of any man I've ever known, and he got more so the longer he was married. Now, a survey of 6,000 respondents, a, a Associated Press poll reported by the Associated Press, reports that the average American male has had seven sexual partners in his lifetime. John F. Kennedy had 33 in three years. Uh, and if we include his wife, that would be 34. So uh, he's many standard deviations above that. So one of the first lessons of this enterprise was to realize that John F. Kennedy had a mental illness. It's called hypersexual disorder, and he fits it rather perfectly. So, whoa. So when we get to um, looking at the prosecution and the defense, I wanted to have a chapter devoted to each. So uh, the best evidence against Oswald uh, is the following. Oswald is seen as the lone gunman. Uh, there were three shots fired from his rifle from the Texas School Book Depository in seven seconds. Um, a palm print was found at the base of the rifle, but you kind of had to take the rifle apart to find it. Oswald's clipboard was found at the scene of the crime. Witnesses placed Oswald on the sixth floor 30 minutes before the shooting. And there, is, there were a number of, when Oswald scurried out of the building, went to his house, got his uh, pistol, <clears throat> and uh, put on a different shirt, uh, left, he was confronted by Officer Tippett and allegedly shot him. There were witnesses to that. So that would be the case of the prosecution. Now, curiously, every time we have the 10th of the, set, the 20th of the 30th or 40th anniversary of the assassination, the media always seems to present the same story, that the Warren Commission was right, that conspiracists are just paranoid, and that's how that story is always given. It's amazing. Now, uh, there was a book written by a man named... Gerald Posner, who uh, didn't, this, he report, I mean, his book got incredible publicity. He, I think it was on the front cover of U.S. News and World Report. He's always over the media. Every time there's an anniversary show, and there's going to be a 50th anniversary show uh, in November of 2013, he's always there. He's always saying, uh, it's, he's basically the Warren Commission um, made modern. And he says all of that other stuff, that conspiracy stuff, is nonsense. And for some reason, he's always quoted. And I, I, in terms of uh, the actual scholarship, I do not see uh, scholarship there that is even close to some of the scholarship that, we, that, are, that exists on this. Anthony Summers, Grodin, Livingston, these are the scholars of the Kennedy assassination period. Jim Mars, not Gerald Posner. At any rate... The second aspect of this would be to present the case of conspiracy theory, which is the case of reasonable doubt. So imagine that Oswald's in the courtroom and he has uh, a, a legal team which is presenting his case. Well, these are the basic thoughts here. First of all, Oswald's fingerprints are missing. Uh, he allegedly shoots this rifle, uh, leaves the cartridges on the floor, some chicken that he was eating on the floor, uh, and scurries down to the lunchroom in 90 seconds, where he is confronted by a policeman in front of a Coca-Cola machine. Well, um, Oswald said he was in the lunchroom all the time. He was never up there shooting anybody. Okay, he had no idea what they were talking about. So did Oswald wipe his fingerprints off the trigger, off the barrel? If he, was he wearing gloves? Because no gloves were ever found. Where did he throw them in his 90 seconds? Uh, it's peculiar that there were no fingerprints found anywhere on that 
thing, except well, if you disassembled the rifle, you would find a palm print. His mother said they placed the palm print there after he was dead. Um, Oswald said he was in the lunchroom, and they said, okay, if you're in the lunchroom, who else was in the lunchroom? You didn't even see the Kennedy assassination? No, I was in the lunchroom. I didn't watch it. Okay, well, um, who else came into the lunchroom in the 15 minutes you were there? And he named two people, and he was correct. Hmm, how did he do that? Motive. There's absolutely no information of any empirical sort that would suggest that Oswald did not like JFK. He and his wife Marina had a coffee table book uh, on JFK. He appeared to like JFK. He never said anything that Marina reported that uh, indicated that he hated Kennedy. There's a, there's a lot of good evidence that Kennedy was hit by a frontal shot, not a rear shot, which means the gunman was not in the depository. He was in the front of Kennedy. There is Dictabelt report recordings in the story of the magic bullet. <clears throat> and here's that story. A policeman has a radio which is left on. Many years after the assassination, the Dictabelt recording is seems to show four shots. Uh, this is sent out to two acoustics firms, preeminent acoustics firms, and they say this is not an echo, this is not a backfire of a motorcycle, these are gunshots. There are 24 acoustic signatures of a gunshot, and there were 24 gunshots. I'm sorry, <laughs> there, there were four gunshots. Well, you can't do four gunshots uh, from the Texas School Book Depository in seven seconds. Uh, no one has ever really succeeded in doing that. So the, the Warren Commission reconstruction of this crime is that a bullet passes through Kennedy, out of Kennedy, into Governor Conley, through Governor Conley, and shatters Governor Conley's wrists. Um, then uh, that bullet is discovered mysteriously just sitting on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. And it's the one to you see to your left. So the Warren Commission took the gun and the the bullet, that same kind of ammunition, shot it into a carcass of an animal. And look at how it's deformed. So the pristine bullet, as it's called, travels through Kennedy, through Conley, breaks Conley's wrist, and still looks that good. Hmm. Was it planted? Or did it magically do all of that? There were a number of eyewitnesses on the grassy knoll who said that the gunman and the shots came from the grassy knoll. And there's an awful lot of anecdotal and circumstantial evidence that would be presented in a trial. So let's take a look a little more closely. First of all, was Kennedy shot from the front? <clears throat> in um, the early 70s, no one had been allowed to see the Zapruder film. I wonder why. Uh, finally, a few journalists were given uh, access to it. Dan Rather was one of those journalists. So he got to see the Zapruder film. And he said, Kennedy was shot and fell violently forward. Oh, okay, well, he must have been shot from behind. Well, if you look now that the Zapruder film is out, frame 314 and then frame 15, you can see that Kennedy is moving backwards, not forwards. Okay, now here is the actual movie of that. I'm going to play it for you twice. I want you to watch two scenes, one frame 314, and ask yourself, is he being shot from the front and being and shot and falling backwards, or was he shot from behind? The second thing is that Jackie Kennedy, for some reason, gets out of her seat and goes to the trunk of the car, and everybody thinks there's a Secret Service name agent whose name is Clint Hill. He's com coming into, it's almost as if she's reaching back to help Clint Hill go forward. But that's not the case. Clint Hill just wrote a book in 2012 and said she was climbing back to pick up a piece of John F. Kennedy's skull and hair that had flown off and flown backward. And if you look closely, you can see that she's not helping Clint Hill in the car. She's picking something up. So watch this uh, film very carefully. This version tracks the limousine and maintains President Kennedy and Governor Conley at center frame. This version is only in slow motion. 
So as he goes behind this sign, he gets hit in the throat. And he's grasping his throat now. We're coming up to frame 314. He's bending forward. Frontal shot. Violently backward, Dan, not violently forward. Jackie reaches back, picks something up. Not Clint Hill. She's already going back in the limousine. So I'm going to play that for you again. Now, again, when you see Jackie going back, notice that she is not touching Clint Hill's hand. She's already moving back into the limousine with something that she picked up on the back of the car. Look, picks it up, goes back in. That's a fragment of John F. Kennedy's skull. So if you're shot in the front, it explodes backwards, doesn't it? Well, you'd be surprised how much Gerald Posner tried with his verbal gymnastics to say, no, 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 that's not the case. There was no frontal shot. So after the uh, cars leave, uh, many, many people started running towards the grassy knoll where they thought the shot came from. Altogether, there were 51 witnesses, including police officers, who said they heard shots from the grassy knoll. So imagine Oswald's defense lawyers calling those witnesses, if they're still alive, or getting their testimony, and presenting it and saying the shots did not come from where Oswald was allegedly positioned. So there's more on reasonable doubt. And we would like to, if, as were his defense lawyers, uh, bring up two matters here, cover-up and mysterious death of witnesses. So with respect to the cover-up, um, <clears throat> there are 60-some stories here in my book. Uh, here's one. Um, a CIA agent named Regis Blauhut goes to the National Archives where Kennedy autopsy photographs are kept, the originals, and he wants to see them, and he sees them. But then he tries to steal one or two of those photographs. He tries to steal it from the National Archives, and he's caught. And he says, there's other things involved that are detrimental to other things. Regis Blauhaupt. I don't know if he was fired for that, but why would a CIA officer be uh, instructed to steal the autopsy photographs of the Kennedy assassination? Hmm, curious. That's just one of 60-some examples in, uh, in this table. So, for example, <clears throat> it's alphabetized. Joseph, I'm not going to go through all of this. Joseph Alsop, famous American columnist. Jack Kennedy gets inaugurated to be president, goes to the inaugural ball, looks very fancy, comes home with Jackie, says, I'm going to go back to Joseph Alsop's party. And Jackie goes to sleep. So he goes to Joseph Alsop's party, meets two girls, goes to a back bedroom, and has a menage a trois on inauguration night. Uh, America's uh, first president and his uh, first menage a trois. Uh, and I'm sure there were many that, to follow. Joseph Alsop uh, did not report these things. Many journalists knew what was going on, never said a thing. Okay, that's called cover up. So we have a lot of instances, uh, and it, we include Dan Rather, because cover up also involves disinformation. So if you say he falls violently, forward, um, we're going to put you in our table here. Now, <clears throat> there's in conspiracy literature this wild uh, thing about all these witnesses that disappeared. It's uh, You can find it in Oliver Stone's movies. And I thought, what are we going to do with this? Some, sometimes 50 people, sometimes 150 people, sometimes 200 people are listed. Uh, and then uh, statements like the trillions of uh, trillion to one odds that, that could have happened by chance. And I said, well, I'm going to try to put my teeth into this one. I wanted to find out of those witnesses how many you could actually get the cause of death from and the age of death from. And so, well, uh, let me give you three little stories here to introduce you to this idea. David Ferry um, is a... Um, um, a pedophile, a pilot, a person who has uh, uh, involvement with uh, anti-Castro Cubans, who has involvement with the mafia, 
uh, who made a speech saying Kennedy should be killed. Uh, Jim Garrison, the New Orleans district attorney, indicted him as part of a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. And he was on the list of people who were part of that conspiracy. Jim Garrison. If you haven't heard of it, that's in the Oliver Stone movie. Uh, he had a friend named Eladio Del Val, who was also an anti-Castro Cuban. Uh, he lived in Miami. James Worrell. Okay, now, uh, David Ferry gets indicted by Jim Garrison he, and tells Jim Garrison, you just signed my death warrant. Well, that's peculiar. So David Ferry commits suicide, leaves a suicide note typed, but dies of a brain aneurysm. So how do you die of a brain aneurysm and leave a suicide note typed? Very peculiar. Within 24 hours of David Ferry, and this is before David Ferry uh, is actually uh, being called on in a deposition to testify. Eladio Duval, his friend in Miami, is hatcheted to death within 24 hours of David Ferry's so-called suicide. Really? And that has no connection to the Kennedy assassination? Give me a break. And then there's James Worrell. He was 26. He was uh, parked his uh, motorcycle behind the depository. He was in behind the depository. And the, the shooting occurs, and he sees a man in a suit running out of the depository. And he said, that wasn't Oswald. He, was, he wasn't wearing a suit. It was a guy in a suit running out of the depository. Uh, James Worrell uh, mysteriously died uh, shortly thereafter in a motorcycle accident. Coincidence, maybe. So I decided to uh, do something with this data. I found 84 cases where I could determine the age of death and the cause of death. And then I wanted to compare the cause of death to the cause of death uh, to the demographics of uh, epidemiology of, of death in 1963. So in the uh, darker column, you see the percentage of people in the United States who died from suicide or murder or accidents or natural causes. And on the right, in the blue, you see the Kennedy sample of these 84 people and whether or not they conform to the pattern of death that is normal in the United States of America. And if you just look at it, you say, oh my God, of course it isn't. If you do a statistical analysis of this chi-square, it's like one chance in 10,000 that this could have happened by chance. It's highly statistically significant. In other words, there are like four times more suicides in this sample than there are in the country. And there are like 10 times more murders in this sample than there are in the country. And look at... Even accidental deaths, James Worrell, uh, accidental death, right? Died in a motorcycle accident. Except that they're more than two times higher in frequency than in the, in the country. And people are not dying from natural causes here. So uh, you have to, as a social scientist, come to one conclusion. This pattern of death did not arise from... Ra it is not coincidence. It's not random. There is a systematic character to this pattern of information. If you saw, if you had a, a community of people and you thought maybe there's leukemia, maybe there's a higher incidence of leukemia in my neighborhood, you would do an analysis like this, an epidemiological analysis. And if you saw data like that, you would definitely conclude there's something, uh, my community is suffering from leukemia way far more than they should be. So this is a, a uh, an indictment that something else is going on here. In 19, uh, between 1975 and 77, the House Committee and the Senate Committee decided to investigate the assassination of John F. Kennedy. They were going to call witnesses the Warren Commission never called. Um, and all of these witnesses that you see here were killed either after or before their testimony. This is probably the highest incidence of the death of witnesses ever in American history in any congressional inquiry. Uh, Sam Giancana was going to be called to testify. He was shot five times around the mouth as if to say, keep your mouth shut. Okay, all these people are murdered or committing suicide 
or having accidental deaths. George de Morinchal was a friend of Kennedy of Oswald. He uh, was writing a book called Patsy. He didn't think Oswald did it. Uh, they, they were going to come to in, uh, in, uh, interview him. They knocked on his door. He went upstairs and uh, shot himself and killed himself. So these are all uh, very interesting stories. And we're supposed to say, oh, all of that occurred and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the Kennedy assassination. Uh, it's, all, it's all somehow Gerald Posner manages to try to dismiss all of it as part of conspiracy theory. These people actually did die and they were actually called as witnesses in front of these committees. So if we were to summarize what the, by the way, two moot court uh, attempts were made to, um, to have a trial of Lee Harvey Oswald and, and in both cases Oswald was acquitted so here are, here's the summary, the summation for the defense. Was there a frontal shot? Very likely. Uh, was there a systematic cover-up? Indisputable. Uh, was there, was Oswald, what was Oswald's motive to kill JFK? Almost no evidence for it. Uh, evidence for a fourth shot? Absolutely excellent. Random causes of mysterious deaths? Highly unlikely, folks. Uh, informed non-believers, Robert Kennedy, Warren Commission member Hale Boggs, Senator Russell, Senator Cooper, even Lyndon Johnson, they didn't believe the Warren Commission report. Why should you if you're on the jury? Okay, so if we were to look at who done it and uh, the conspiracy theories, there are maybe five major theories, and I wanted to present the pro and con of each of these theories. Okay, so let's start with Lyndon Johnson did it, okay? Well, here's evidence against Lyndon Johnson. First of all, as vice president, he was under, uh, Kennedy didn't like him. He didn't like Kennedy. Kennedy wanted to get rid of him. One of the last things Kennedy did was to say, Lyndon Johnson's not gonna be on the ticket. Johnson was, being, uh, uh, was under investigation for ethics violations. His number one man um, was uh, already indicted for ethics violation. Johnson was afraid he was going to go to jail. He left Washington and went to Dallas to, to lay low uh, in the months before the assassination. Uh, he always wanted to pre be president since he was a little boy. He went, Kennedy only met with him once in the last year of his presidency, but Johnson drove his car at his limousine, take him to the White House every morning. He got out of the car, walked into the White House, walked out the other side as if he was meeting with the president, got in his limousine and went to his own offices. But he didn't meet the president. It was all for show. Uh, he was one of the few people who had advanced knowledge of the parade route of uh, the motorcade in Dallas. Um, one high-level CIA official uh, on his deathbed indicted Lyndon Johnson for the murder of John F. Kennedy. And uh, what people don't realize is that the person who was going to investigate the assassination of the president was the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy. He think, I think he would have done a very good job. But Johnson created the Warren Commission, which investigated it and made Bobby Kennedy no longer relevant to the issue. That's a good way to get rid of Bobby Kennedy. By the way, the Warren Commission never called uh, Johnson to testify. Interesting, curious, convenient. Now, uh, Johnson had some uh, personality problems. He was a heavy drinker. Uh, he was a bit of a womanizer, and he was very much a narcissist. He, uh, uh, everybody was branded with LBJ. L. Lyndon Baines, his wife was Lady Bird Johnson. His daughter was Linda Bird Johnson. His friend John Connolly was called Little Boy Johnson. Everybody had this LBJ um, branding. When he met the Pope, he gave the Pope a bust of himself as a gift. And there he is admiring his bust. Amazing. Yeah. So here's his mistress. Uh, the Let's night before the, the assassination. Before, when, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry. He had a 
violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you. What did he say he, to he, you? Uh, he grabbed me by the arm, and he had this deep voice, and he said, after tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. And it, it startled me, really, you know, because he was so ready-faced. And I thought, oh, well, he really, uh, something went on that shouldn't have gone on, you know. But uh, he called me from the Texas hotel the next morning as I was going downtown. Right. And hear this screaming voice of his. Uh, he was so irate. What were the words he said to you on the phone? That, uh, that they would never embarrass him again. But it's so be the Irish Mafia, I think. He referred to him as the Irish Mafia very often. He said they would never embarrass him again. I'd never embarrass him again. There was no threat. That was a promise. And there were violent feelings that have never been told that was between those two people. Okay, so. Uh, Johnson actually had uh, a couple mistresses during uh, these years. Um, now, Howard Hunt was a CIA agent. He was the CIA agent who was the Mexico City chief of station at the time that Oswald allegedly went to Mexico City. And the conspiracists have always thought that E. Howard Hunt had something to do with this. The three tramps that were arrested in Daly Plaza, one looked exactly like E. Howard Hunt. Howard Hunt said, no, I was never in Dallas. I was eating at a Chinese restaurant in Virginia. Thank you very much. And people wondered, always wondered about Howard Hunt. Anyway, he's ready to die. He writes a book. And uh, uh, people like me said, well, I really want to know what's in it. Nothing. No revelations at all. Uh, so deathbed book, no confession, nothing. However, his son um, talks to his dad before his dad dies, and his dad reveals something to his son he didn't reveal in his book and didn't reveal anyway. And, uh, and he says that LBJ, LBJ was behind the um, assassination of John F. Kennedy. Here is the for honesty. I think it's essential to refocus on what this information that I've been providing you uh, and you alone, by the way, consists of what is important in the story is that we've backtracked the chain of command up uh, through, uh, through Cordmeyer and laying the, uh, the uh, doings at the doorstep of LBJ. He was sick. Uh, and he wrote this out, as you, as you can see, by the handwriting with uh, great difficulty. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to read some of it, uh, but uh, at the top here we have uh, the initials LBJ, which of course was a vice president at the time. Uh, below this we have Cord Meyer, who was a CIA officer. Um, below that we have a name David Morales, who was also a, a CIA um, I don't know if he was official CIA, but I, I certainly heard his name before in relation to contract work that he did with the CIA. Harvey, who was a very flamboyant CIA man, carried around a couple pistols in his belt at all times, was a heavy drinker. Um, and below at the bottom it says French gunman Grassy Knoll. Clandestine limitations. He did not want his career to come to an end as vice president. Uh, who knows about vice presidents? It was very, uh, very important to him that he take advantage as to the extent that he could as vice president because uh, just a few things had to be accomplished. He had to kill Kennedy, have or have him killed, I should say, and uh, uh, be guilt-free himself that he could go on and uh, do what he wanted to do as President of the United States. So, um, now, there's another uh, strange little story here, too. Um, and it, it all fits into the circumstantial plots here that we're weaving, uh, indicting Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Mary Pinchot Meyer is uh, the former wife of Cord Meyer. 
They get divorced. She takes up with John F. Kennedy. Uh, uh, they had, had been friends. She had been friends with Jackie Kennedy. She became Kennedy's mistress. She might have been the last woman to ever sleep with John F. Kennedy. It's alleged the two of them took acid together. Uh, their, their relationship, their sexual relationship, went on probably about six months. Um, her uh, uh, not estranged husband, divorced husband, Cord Meyer, is a very high official in the CIA. Mary Pinchot Meyer says uh, in her diary, she writes to this to her sister or her sister-in-law and says, uh, 10 months after the Kennedy assassination, she's worried for her life. She feels that she is in danger. She writes this in her diary. Lo and behold, Mary Pinchot Meyer is murdered in Washington, D.C. A black man is indicted for it and is ultimately acquitted. Her, her murder remains unsolved to this day. Now, uh, her sister-in-law, who's married to the president or the head of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, goes to her apartment to uh, find her diary, which she had told her about. But when they get to the apartment, that like the day after her murder, somebody's there and has broken into the apartment. And it's the guy on your right, James Jesus Angleton, head of counterintelligence for the CIA. He picked the lock himself, walked in and grabbed the diary. They never saw it again. No one has ever seen it again. Whoa. Now that's just one little story of, of hundreds in this little episode we're talking about. Now, there's a last conspiratorial assertion. Bobby Kennedy is going to run for president of the United States. If he becomes president, one of the first things he's going to do is open up the Warren Commission investigation and find out who killed his brother. If Johnson was involved in that, and he went through the whole process of creating the Warren Commission so that Bobby would not be able to investigate it, then Bobby's ascendancy to, presidency, to the presidency is uh, a threat to Johnson. Uh, suddenly, Bobby Kennedy's murdered. Hmm. Isn't that curious and convenient? So, that uh, presents the LBJ theory, and you can say, boy, that's really convincing. But then you start thinking, wait a minute, let's be objective here. What thing, What are the loose ends that are not explained? If LBJ did it, how did he set up Oswald to be the patsy? Who got Oswald the job at the Texas School Book Depository? Did they have any connection to Lyndon Johnson? I don't see any. Uh, if LBJ was involved in Bobby Kennedy's murder, what's the connection between LBJ and Sirhan Sirhan? I don't see any. Okay, so there are, if you start getting down into the specifics, uh, the LBJ theory does not uh, uh, provide you much. There was a, there is information about uh, those CIA agents and the Lucien Sarti, the uh, Corsica um, uh, hitman that was hired by Bill Harvey. There is a, a, that strain that uh, might be logical, but there are a lot of loose ends here that do not tie up easily. All right, the next theory is the mafia theory. And this takes, uh, I'm gonna do this in abbreviated fashion. It starts way back in the 1930s with Joseph Kennedy, who's involved with uh, making whiskey and Seagrams and uh, Prohibition. The Purple Gang of Detroit, smuggling in uh, booze from Canada, uh, runs in, has a confrontation somehow with Joseph Kennedy's interest. Kennedy made millions of dollars during the Great Depression, during the crash. And the... Uh, Joseph Costello, the head of the syndicate, puts out a contract on Joseph Kennedy's life. Joseph Kennedy tries to meet with Costello and uh, defuse the situation, and they develop some kind of a relationship after that. Uh, flash forward a generation to the Kennedy election. Sam Giancana is the mafia boss of Chicago now. He's got a girlfriend named Judith Exner Campbell. Um, the Kennedys allegedly asked Giancana's help in getting the election fixed for John F. Kennedy in Illinois and in Virginia, which he does, he dutifully does. And he believes that once Kennedy's elected, he's going to have his man in the White House. In the meantime, John F. Kennedy is sleeping with his girlfriend, Giancana's girlfriend, Judith Exner Campbell, all the way into 1962. Whoa. 
Now, in the meantime, Robert Kennedy, who wanted to be a priest, is very idealistic, and he's going to attack the mafia. He's going to prosecute the mafia. He's going to put these so-called grease balls in prison where they belong. And what's Jack and his father doing? That? Jack's father is sleeping with mafia-supplied prostitutes in uh, the Cal Neva Lodge in Lake Tahoe and in Palm Springs, according to one source. And Bobby is prosecuting the same people. Whoa, here's a little excerpt of Bobby interviewing James Hoffa, who ultimately he put away. In a position to exercise influence in the transport lanes of the world. The free world will have suffered a staggering blow. I am not interested in Beck's politics or his philosophy. I'm interested in the workers. Well, do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with it because the American worker will never put anybody at the head of unions. That will disrupt the American uh, system. Well, do you know who made that statement? I don't know and I don't care. Probably Beck. It sounds like him. Mr. James Riddle Hoff. I don't believe it. What do you think of that? I don't believe it. What do you think of that? While leaving the hearings after these people had testified regarding this matter, did you say that SOB I'll break his back? Who? You. I did to who? To anyone. Did you make that statement? Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Thank you for your speech. I don't even know what I was talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you, uh, Mr. Hoffa, all I'm trying to find out, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm trying to find out whose back you're going to break. Thank you for your speech. What? Big so... <laughs> Uh, Bobby Kennedy is very successful in his efforts, uh, even though J. Edgar Hoover opposes his uh, desire to attack the mafia, and he doesn't even believe there is a mafia. And uh, But there is a contradiction between Joseph Kennedy and Jack Kennedy's relationship. Judith Exeter Campbell said in her book that she was sending messages. She was a courier. She would give messages back to Sam from Jack Kennedy. Uh, so... Robert Kennedy is prosecuting the same people that Joe Kennedy and Jack Kennedy are consorting with. So, uh, the uh, 700 people are put away, and the head of the mafia, these three guys, say something has to be stopped. We have to kill Bobby Kennedy. And uh, one says, um, if you kill Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy is the president of the United States, he'll destroy the mafia. you gotta hit, You got to kill the head of the snake. And so the plot was hatched to kill the president so that Bobby B. Kennedy would just become another lawyer, as they said. So these are the three major mafia figureheads who are uh, part of the plot. In the meantime, J. Edgar Hoover is gay. They call him a, a bachelor in those days. Uh, his longtime companion, Clyde Tolson, is also a senior figure in the FBI. They're always together. They have lunch together. You saw the movie. Um, but they have a picture of J. Edgar Hoover uh, ha giving fellatio to Clyde Tolson, and J. Edgar is wearing a dress, and he calls himself Mary. Uh, uh, because the, uh, uh, by the way, the CIA also had a copy of that picture. Anyway, Hoover is very paranoid about the um, mafia exposing him, and he does not proceed against the mafia at all. all right. So. The most reasonable theory, in my view, is that these three plotters, and you could add another person named Tony Arcado, and the hit squad, which involved Charles Nicoletti, John Rosselli, and James Files, uh, they pulled off the Kennedy assassination. Uh, I interviewed James Files, who was a CIA contract agent, anti-Castro person, and also a mafia hitman. He killed a policeman and was sent in Chicago and was sentenced to life in prison. He's in a very difficult prison in Illinois. I wrote to him for a few years and asked him questions. And um, he wrote back. I'll tell you about that more. But here is uh, an excerpt of James Files, who I think is uh, has very good reason to be thought of as the grassy knoll gunman. Told him that Joe knew you were on the well, I asked him, he said that someone had informed him that I was there. He said he had a reliable source. And I didn't know for quite a while who that source was. It was quite some time later before I learned the fact that the FBI was aware of my presence as early as 1964. But I never knew that anyone ever knew about me. But Zach Sheldon, from what I understand, and I'm only quoting this from hearsay, that Zach is the one that stated 
and gave me to Joe West the information on me that I was indeed in Plaza. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Like with Joe West. Joe West died. Do you have any thoughts on his death? Do you think that was natural? Joe West went in for heart surgery, and from what I was told and what I understood, that he had come through it fairly well, and he was on the road to recovery. But then I was informed there was complications with his medicine. He was allergic to it or an allergy or something. He saw that it killed him, the medication killed him. A couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I heard through the grapevine, and I won't go into the party that brought this information to me, they said that someone had tampered with Joe's medication and he had received the wrong medication because they wanted to silence him. That's uh, for his wife. Yeah. Okay. So why would they want to sign him? We had the, uh, I shouldn't say we, I would say Joe West had the case in court. He wanted to exhume John F. Kennedy's body. And that's what he was fighting for. And at this point, when I talked to Joe West, I explained to him that John F. Kennedy had been hit in the head with a mercury round, a special load. At this point, I explained to him, he can use this in the courts to have the body exhumed because there would still be traces of mercury because the traces of mercury do not disappear. They will always be there. And so this is what Joe West wanted to go back with more evidence and use this to get Kennedy's body exhumed to look for traces of mercury. And the court had accepted his case? The court had accepted his case. But with his death, the case died. So, uh, I have another clip of this uh, fellow, but I was writing him at the time, and um, I found his answers intriguing. He would take a couple months to write back. I guess the letters had to go through censors. And um, then he said, uh, Professor Croth, um, uh, you got to know about Joe West, uh, because uh, he, he said uh, he was killed using cyan phosphate, use uh, some kind of... Uh, drug that is injected into you and leaves no trace. Well, I got very scared and I said, well, thank you very much. I, I wanted to give James Files uh, the full feeling that I was off the case. So I said, I'm just a university professor. I've got two kids. I think I don't want to be involved in anything that involves danger to myself or my family. So I'm dropping this. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, whatever I was going to do with this book, I've decided not to. So bye. So. Um, I did that, and I waited for a couple years. I hadn't really given up on the idea of the book, but I was thinking maybe I won't include this section or something. Uh, and then two years went by, and I didn't get any strange phone calls or anything, and I decided, well, I'm going to go back and ask some more questions. I would ask this guy things that nobody, uh, you had to really be a Kennedy aficionado to know. I would say, do you know this person's name and what their connection was? And then his answers were so uncannily accurate. I thought, maybe he's, maybe he's uh, kidding. I, maybe he wants to get out of prison. He thinks this is going to help him. So I made up some names. I just, I would say, who was Sam Saya? Sam Saya was the uh, friend of the uncle of Lee Harvey Oswald, who had some mafia connections. That's three persons removed. Nobody knows who Sam Saya is. He writes back, Sam say, uh, I never like drug dealers. Right on, right on the button. But then I would make up names just to test him and see what he was up to. And he wouldn't uh, exaggerate. He would say, I don't know that guy. So um, I never got an answer from J I mean, this man has real difficulty spelling. Uh, he's not the most literate man in the world. Uh, but I could not find a single answer that he gave me that was clearly wrong or clearly a lie unless it all was you know but it was very 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 convincing to me so here's a last excerpt of James Files at the safe from what I could see from the expulsion there were probably 60 percent of the brains went out to the back end of the car through the scope I watched Jackie crawl out there and get a piece of skull bar and hair and everything and I closed the briefcase I put it up and I walked away and like I say, police officer ran up, dropped his motorcycle. Uh, just before I left, I took the ejection shell, but I put another light round into the magazine because the Remington Fireball is a single-shot bolt action. 
I ejected the first one out, took the other one, popped it right in, I put the casing in my mouth, stuck it on the cord, and as I walked away like a snake, when I seen the policeman running up the hill, I shifted my remember the fireball in the briefcase to my left hand and put my hand inside my jacket pocket, which there was no pocket there on the one side. I could reach right in and pull the weapon out. And the one gentleman there that had been by the fence that I was a little concerned about at the beginning, stepped forward, he turned the police officer back, and I kept on walking away. And it was that. I did not go down the stairs. I didn't walk off the grassy knoll. I walked out from where the dead end street is here back across the Daltech building. What kind of, uh, when you got into the car and exited the scene of the crime, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of speed were you driving at? Very normal. I didn't burn no tires, but I think I just turned out, made a right hand turn. Proceeded to be this Houston Street that runs that direction. Made a right hand turn out of the Dow Tech building on the Houston Street, went down a few blocks. Took a left over the main thoroughfare, pulled up at a gas station. I let Mr. Nicoletti and Mr. Roselli out. When I got back to the vehicle, Johnny Roselli was sitting in the back seat. Charles Nicoletti was in the right front passenger seat. The trunk lid was down and locked. I could see it was closed, it wasn't popped open a little bit or anything. I opened the car door, got in, and I set the case, my case down with a fireball right behind the front seat, got in, started the car, and we drove out natural, just like three businessmen. So he stays in a Dallas motel in the suburbs, goes back to Chicago, gets $36,000 for the hit, and keeps his mouth shut. Um, the reason he was found out was that an FBI agent gave Joe West uh, secret information and said, you better check out this guy. And that's how Joe West found out about him. And uh, that's how the world found out about James Files. So um, uh, I would like to go on to the, no the next theory here, which is the anti-Castro CIA conspiracy. This is a long story involving lots and lots of people. And the basic idea here is that Kennedy betrayed the anti-Castro Cubans who were CIA sponsored uh, he didn't provide air cover for the Bay of Pigs invasion, and they all got captured by Castro. And they all felt that Kennedy betrayed them and should be killed. A lot of them did, that is to say. So uh, Kennedy fired a number of high CIA officials after the Bay of Pigs for improperly advising him, one of whom was Alan Dulles. So here's a, a little element of this story. Uh, Sylvia Odio is a Cuban, uh, the daughter of a Cuban, who is a democratic Cuban uh, who is under arrest by Castro in Cuba. And his daughters are living in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he's not a right winger, he's a left winger, the father is. Sylvia is 16 years old. There's a knock on the door. She lives with her sister, Annie. And three men are there, one of whom is Lee Oswald. He calls himself Leon. And the other guys say he's a former Marine, he's a sharpshooter, and he's a, he's a wild man. He could kill Kennedy, he could kill Castro, he could shoot anybody. So they, just, they introduce him as Leon Oswald. Now, what's interesting here is that this is the weekend that Oswald was supposed to be in Mexico City applying for a visa to go back to Russia and to go to Cuba, okay, where he visited the Cuban and Soviet consulates. Except that he's not there. He's in Dallas meeting Sylvia Odio with two anti-Castro Cubans who are his so-called partners who are doing all of the talking. Well, uh, Sylvia uh, writes to her father and says, who are these people? And her father says, I don't know any of them. Stay away from them. Don't let them in again. I don't know. These are not people who are uh, of any interest to me. So Sylvia doesn't say anything to anybody, but then she sees Oswald's face on the day of the assassination. I think she faints. She said, that's the guy that was in my house. And um, she tells a friend of hers, but doesn't tell anybody else. The friend uh, lets the FBI know, like uh, many, many months after the assassination, the FBI decides to investigate this because this contradicts the Warren Commission. This is just before the Warren Commission final document is to appear. Sylvia Odio said, no, he wasn't. In, he was in my apartment, okay, in Dallas, posing as an anti-Castro mercenary. Along comes a man named Lauren Hall. He was also an anti-Castro mercenary, and he tells the FBI, no, 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 that wasn't, I, oh, it was an Oswald, that was me. I met her at, in the Dallas apartment, okay? It was me. 
And so the Warren Commission says, oh, thank God, that takes care of that loose end. And then the Warren Commission document is printed, and Sylvia Odio doesn't even appear in that document. Now, in the 1970s, the House Assassination Committee is investigating. They're going to call Lauren Hall as a witness, and he said, I'll testify only with immunity from prosecution. And what does he testify? He testifies that he lied to the FBI. He said he was the guy who visited Sylvia Odio, and it wasn't true. He never met Sylvia Odio. She said she never met him either. So the story of Sylvia Odio and meeting Lee Harvey Oswald is probably true. And Lauren Hall is an admitted liar. That's as far as that story goes. But there's that kind of intrigue in this approach. So the people who are involved, who are mentioned and named, those names go on and on and on. General Cabell, fired by uh, Kennedy during the Bay of Pigs. David Phillips, William Harvey, E. Howard Hunt, who you met. David Ferry, Daniel Carswell, Guy Bannister, Eugene Hale Brady, Lauren Hall again. James Angleton, CIA, Alan Dulles, CIA, Chauncey Holt, and there are more names here for this thing, for this uh, conspiracy theory. Now, Gerald Posner says, ridiculous, conspiratorial, paranoid, none of it ever happened. These are the imaginings and the ruminations of people who have nothing better to do with their lives. The CIA had nothing to do with Kennedy assassination. He said, David Ferry, if you can prove a connection between David Ferry and Lee Oswald, okay, you have a possible connection. But there is no connection between Oswald and any of these people, especially David Ferry, okay? There is no connection. And of course, Gerald Posner gets all that publicity and poo-poos the theory. Well, a man came up with a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald at the age of 15, uh, or his teenager, um, in the civilian air patrol. And there's David, Har uh, David Ferry from Cleveland, Ohio, and Lee Harvey Oswald in the same picture. They actually did know each other. So much for Gerald Posner's uh, anti-conspiratorial ramblings. So, there are other theories covered in the book, and then I want to spend some time looking at this as a psychological myth. And um, this is what you call psychohistory or psychoanalytic anthropology, Jungian collective psychology. It gives a different kind of perspective on everything. So um, there are some terms here in psychology. Numinosity, which you've been introduced to, archetypes, Jungian, symbols that are involved, projections, the shadow, that's the opposite of one's public persona. Um, let's take a look. If you were starting to think about this as a psychologist after all of this research, well, if you think about it as a myth, and all these characters are kind of walking on stage, Sam Giancana, Judith Exner Campbell, Marilyn Monroe, General Cabell, all these names are coming on stage and off stage in this, in this myth. Uh, one thing to note is that about 65% of them had a mental disorder, including John F. Kennedy and Mal Marilyn Monroe. Secondly, you notice that denial in this story, censorship, cover-up, secrecy, is all over this myth. There's denial everywhere you look. Third, uh, there are actual similarities between the Camelot symbol, the mythic story of Camelot, and the Kennedy assassination. King Arthur's uh, blood kinsman, Mordred, uh, uh, started things uh, so that the uh, Arthur's court was ultimately destroyed. Bobby Kennedy is kind of like Mordred. His behavior against the mafia probably gave rise to this assassination. It starts from inside, not outside. Then there's a strange symbolism with the number three, which is always found in myths and fairy tales. Uh, Kennedy was in the White House for three years, 33 months. He had 33 mistresses in the White House. There were three tramps arrested in Daly Plaza. There were only three shots fired, not four, not four, not four, three. Okay, the insistence on the number three is incredible. Also, you know, when Kidna, uh, uh, 
the role of scapegoats. If you remember the Lindbergh kidnapping, Bruno Richard Hoffman was executed for the crime. It's very likely he had nothing to do with it, but he was German. He was a symbol of our burgeoning fears of Nazi Germany and Germany itself. He was an unconscious projection of America's fears. Lee Harvey Oswald was the Marxist-Leninist who was uh, scripted to be the scapegoat here, and he was another externalized enemy of, uh, of America as uh, representing our unconscious fears of communism. After all, the Bay of Pigs had uh, our, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was which almost brought the world to a nuclear confrontation, had just occurred, and here we select a Marxist-Leninist as uh, the scapegoat for this crime. There is a, a whole incidence of synchronicity here that's uh, uncanny. Here's a picture. Synchronicity means meaningful coincidence in Jungian theory. There's a picture of John F. Kennedy shaking hands with Bill Clinton, age 16 or 17. The two presidents are meeting across space and time. So Jung says, what is the meaning? It don't just say, oh my God, isn't that a weird coincidence? What is the meta meaning of the coincidence? So, well, uh, they're both tall. They're both from the Democratic Party. But they also had problems with their sexuality. Uh, and uh, Bill Clinton was almost impeached, or he was impeached by the House for his sexuality. So both of them have very significant shadows that trail along with their conscious uh, manifest image. So Jung argues that when you have so much numinosity and synchronicity, you have to look for the archetypal meaning here. JFK and Lincoln are genuine psychological archetypal heroes. And Lee Harvey Oswald and John Wilkes Booth are archetypal anti-heroes, the assassins. And there are a tremendous amount of similarities and concordances between them. Kennedy and Lincoln, both were assassinated. Both were shot on a Friday. Both had a child in the White House. Both had a vice president named Johnson. Both of the Johnsons were suspected in a conspiracy. Both Kennedy and Lincoln were elected a hundred years apart. Both were warned not to attend their particular events. Both were involved with civil rights and the civil rights struggle. And there are similarities between Booth and Oswald. You think, why? What, what's the connection? Both Oswald, I mean Lee, uh, Lee Harvey. Lee was a uh, he was named after General Robert E. Lee. Both uh, Oswald and Booth were from the South. Both were also born a hundred years apart. Both visited an uncle in New Orleans just before the assassination. Both visited a friend named Payne. They both had friends named Payne before the assassination. Both of them bled to death after being shot by a mentally deranged person. After making all these notes, uh, I would like to kind of summarize the uh, how you would put this psychological portrait uh, together to make some sense out of it. So here it comes. Conclusion is that the Kennedy myth has huge parallels with Camelot, as Camelot was a place of idealism and democracy, with the Knights of the Round Table, the first symbolic manifestation of British democracy, Camelot's lofty visions crumbled from inside, toppled by adultery and the behavior of Modred, the younger blood kinsman of King Arthur. The dark side of Camelot, its shadow side, won out over its conscious manifest image of benevolence, bravery, democracy, and justice. And so too did the dark side of the Kennedy administration win out over its conscious and manifest image of youth, competence, idealism, and justice and detente. In fact, the Kennedy administration was actually waging three wars against America's dark, covert, secret shadow side. They tried to get the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover to resign, but he had the dirt on just about everyone in government, and he knew about Judith Exner Campbell and the president. He couldn't be touched, and he stayed in power well into the 1970s. JFK tried to get hold of the CIA, too. He fired many of their top echelon after the Bay of Pigs and sent out executive orders that there was to be no CIA operations without the president's approval. All to naught. 
And finally, through the aegis of Bobby Kennedy, they tried to rid the country of the underworld. But these three wars against America's dark side were not successful. These wars against the American shadow were not merely political, they were personal. John Kennedy had a dark side. Yes, on the conscious front, he was intelligent, Harvard educated, well spoken, a man of peace, justice, reason, good humor. But he was also the most sexually dysfunctional president in American history, a sociopath and an opportunist who did not hesitate to secure the help of the mob in his political ambitions in Illinois and Virginia, both of which helped him win the presidency. His father, the Harvard-educated ambassador, was also indebted to the mob and the continuing recipient of sexual favors from them. Both Jack and his father dragged along huge shadows as they walked across the stage of American history. But priestly Bobby Kennedy righteously and valiantly campaigned against the shadow, as if he were not only trying to clean up America's mess, but his own family's mess at the same time. We're not sure how much he knew of his brother and father's connections. We do know that he was aware of at least of one of JFK's adulterous liaisons with Ellen Romish, an East German agent whom his brother bedded, and who Bobby promptly deported as soon as he learned of it. But we're not sure he knew of all 33 of Jack's playmates, or Judith Exner Campbell, or her connection to Giancana. It is hard to believe Jack was honest with Bobby on this front. If Bobby knew that Jack had been sleeping with Giancana's girlfriend all the way into 1962, how could Bobby have Giancana arrested and handcuffed at the Chicago airport? And we're still not sure if Bobby knew that the CIA was using the mob and Giancana to try to kill Castro at the very same time that Bobby was trying to put Giancana behind bars. We do know that the mob felt double-crossed by the Kennedys. Bobby's relentless war against the American shadow showed early victories. He actually put away Hoffa and 700 other gangsters. Now, as far as the whodunit goes, we don't exactly know if it was the CIA, the FBI, the mob, Johnson, or some combination of these covert elements. Our odds are definitely on the mob. But we do know one thing. The conscious image of America, as idealized by the Kennedys, was undermined, uprooted, and de destroyed by the shadow of the American dream. Americans sense this. It is all around. It has never left us. Our obsession with JFK and the assassination is in part a statement that all is not as it seems. Something else lies under the surface. The conscious image of America is not the truth. Something underneath that image, the shadow of America, is what governs America, the dark side, special interests, power brokers, lobbyists, the military-industrial complex, the CIA, the underworld, whatever you want to call it, the dark force reigns. 75% of Americans do not believe the story that Oswald killed JFK and acted alone. And in 2012, a whopping 89% of Americans said they distrust their government. These two statistics go together. Our image of ourselves, the stories that we tell about our history, <clears throat> cannot be trusted, are not true, are not real. There is a strong belief held by the majority of Americans that something else is happening not what we are told, and not what we are told to believe. That is the meaning of the journey. But observe that Lee Harvey Oswald represents not the real shadow, but the projected shadow, the externalized shadow, the externalized enemy, communism, the Marxist-Leninist, Russian-loving traitor Oswald. Just like John Wilkes Booth came from outside, from the Confederacy, a traitor, an alien, not one of us. Once we give up on Oswald as the true killer, we are forced to look inside for the real killers, not outside at the externalized enemy, but the true enemy within. Believe it or not, Bobby Kennedy actually wrote a book called The Enemy Within. A Hollywood producer was going to make a movie of this controversial book, but unfortunately, just like Marilyn Monroe, he mysteriously died in his home before he could. He was only 49 years old and the movie was never made. <clears throat> Our knowledge of this enemy within is marginal, censored, denied, fragmentary, obscured, covered up. It is much easier to identify the enemy outside ourselves, the patsy, the scapegoat. And as long as it remains easier to externalize our dark side, 
then Lee Harvey Oswald will always be the Marxist-Leninist lone assassin of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, firing three shots in the third year and on the 33rd month of his presidency. The myth shall remain intact, whatever the cost. On the 50th anniversary of the assassination this coming November, you can bet that the mainstream media will come out in force to remind us that we can trust our government, trust that what it says is the truth, trust that the assassination was the result of one left-leaning Marxist-Leninist lone assassin. And to add verisimilitude, Gerald Posner will again stand under the Klieg lights to tell us it is all true and that our suspicions to the contrary should be discarded and forgotten. As if to say, Amen, America, and sleep tight. <laughs>